All right. We have seen one of the biggest bull runs that we have seen in the last few decades, frankly. Um, yeah. And we want to talk about it today. So, Vuk, what do you think is happening in terms of markets? Like, is it looking like a bubble? Is this just driven by what's happening with AI? What's your what's your take on what's happening in, in financial markets right now? Hey, Scott. Nice to nice to be with you again. Um, so, yeah, it it does look bubblish, right? But it's not not as at least in my opinion, not as um, strong or as as big as it was in, for example, 2021 um, or 2020, even though a lot of people are kind of making all these comparisons um, between specifically like those two, those two. Uh, bubbles like 2021 or or, or, or 2000 or um, 99, 98, 2000. Um, but I don't think like, so. Maybe we are potentially in the beginning of the bubble, but we're not really at you know at the zenith of it. We're not at the at the end of it. And you know what you know what you do when you are at the beginning of the bubble, you ride it. <laughs> you ride the rallies. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, of course, exactly. I mean, there are a lot of signs in a sense that. Um, so, so if you think of, of like the characteristics of some of these previous, previous bubbles, some of these previous episodes, so you had like worthless companies, companies didn't make revenues, well, not worthless, right? but they didn't make any revenues. They were being valued, valued at extremely high prices. What we have now is companies that are making record levels of revenues valued at extremely high prices. So, uh, I mean, even if some people would say that the valuation is not rooted in reality in a sense that these revenues are not as big, um, but with these companies like, you know, NVIDIA, like Meta, like Amazon, beating expectations over and over, um, then essentially we have to ask ourselves, you know, is, is the price warranted? To, to a certain extent it is, right? Um, there's absolutely no way of telling how long this might last. So, for example, and, and a lot of people are linking this to the macro cycles as well, because we know, and we've been talking about this, that in terms of the macro cycle, a recession is imminent. But on the other hand, um, you have to ask yourself about the restrictiveness of monetary policy. So is monetary policy not restrictive enough compared to the neutral rate of interest? Then we can say that, okay, then that's probably why the reason why the economy is not uh, uh, yet in a recession and that we have we still have legs to this rally and to this you know, inflating of the bubble, what we're going to call it. Um, but just like if you look at the asset prices themselves, to answer the first question, if you look at the asset prices themselves, they're not yet exhibiting that type of bubble behavior like we had in 2021, for example, just like to compare ourselves to, to, to what happened a few years ago, um, not to go even even more further in the past. Yeah, so I know this is something that many of our investors are familiar with, but many may not be as well. So what what are some of the conditions or some of the some of the indicators that we look at to say if we're in a bubble or not? So, so again, one of the main ones is look at, the, for example, the Schiller price to earnings ratio. That's some, something that investors love to look at. Um, and even if you look at that ratio specifically, it's not as, as bubblish as it was in, in some of these prior episodes that we mentioned. But there's also a lot of other signs. I mean, I think like there's this, this, this whole confusion about like, are we overinflating things in general or is it just the stock market? Well, perhaps it's just the stock market. If you look at housing, housing is not in its bubble like it was. Uh, as for example, prior to 2008, or again, uh, um, uh, at the beginning of, the, of this decade. Um, so housing has yeah, gone through a correction and people are still expecting stuff to happen then, happen there. Um, but then if you look at just, if you're just focusing, narrowing on the stock market, then yes, you do have these high valuations, but then, you know, it's a question of, are these companies actually worth that much? That's a different, that's a different story. And there is obviously this whole momentum of people shifting a lot of their money from other things into the stock market because it's the only thing that keeps growing. And then you have structural flows, like things like you know uh, uh, institutional investors investing 401ks, 401k account of US uh, uh, citizens, everyone who's working has a 401k account, that all gets invested in the stock market. And these are flows that happen regularly. I mean, this, this always happens, but as we know in this current situation, a lot of people have jobs. A lot of people are employed. The labor market is is looking really well. Uh, unemployment rates are low. Uh, a number of people having a job is very high. So a lot of people are paying in their 401k accounts with rising wages. All this money gets translated indirectly, both directly and indirectly into the stock market. And that keeps driving it up, right? That's why you have all these. So if you look at the past two, three, two months and especially the past six months, 
um, there's a consistent pattern of growth in the stock market, right? And you have every dip, every time there's a slight correction of let's say one, two, three percent, it gets bought, right? The dip gets bought and we just keep growing and growing and growing. So every time there's a dip is an opportunity for someone, someone else to come in and start buying. Um, and, 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 and this was the best way of, of picturing this was what happened during February. So during February, typically in February as a month in itself is a seasonally the worst month for stocks. Um, because you have like the whole, you know, the, the end of the December, the end of year and the beginning of the year, the December, January flows. Uh, then you have the option expiry that happens in February. And then typically there's this window between, between that period and the end of February and, and early March where you would see corrections. We didn't have this this time, right? And furthermore, we did have bad news, right? We had a higher than expected CPI print. We had a higher than expected PPI print. Um, we even had some, uh, um, some other bad news in, uh, uh, going around the economy at that certain point in time. We had the repricing of the federal, uh, of the federal reserve interest rate cuts from, from six cuts to three cuts. And despite all this, we didn't see any prolonged sell off. So every, every, every time the market sold off, for example, during the bad CPI print, it just jumped back up and so on and so forth. There was an event that was supposed to be a trigger. That was the NVIDIA earnings event that mm -hmm. NVIDIA destroyed earnings. It was super, super good. Uh, so the market just kept rallying. That was our, by the way, our best week, um, for the fund, we made 6% that week. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, in this period, um, it's very easy to just say, you know, I'm, we're bullish and let's just keep being bullish, keep buying stuff. And then, and, you know, things keep growing. We are obviously always careful because we look at the micro side of things as well. We, we are aware of you know, high interest rates. We are aware of all the structural problems in the economy that are still there. Uh, we were particularly aware this week of this upcoming CPI numbers, because as you know, if, when the Fed is data dependent, investors should be data dependent as well. You know, a lot of people are saying this is backwards looking. It doesn't matter. It's, it's what the Fed, uh, Fed decides eventually. Um, so yeah, in the next two weeks, we have very interesting um, two events coming up. We have the CPI report. We have the FOMC uh, meeting two weeks from now. Um, obviously, you know, what do you expect from those for meetings? That. Well, yeah, we're, we're, I, I, what I expect for the FOMC, you mean, right? So yes. let, let, let's look at inflation first. So for this week, inflation, um, again, if it keeps overheating, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something that's uh, so obvious, right? If inflation keeps overheating, markets sell off. If it doesn't, uh, we keep on rallying, right? Um, but again, the question is, is it going to be just like February, right? Where any sell off was just quickly bought back and, and we kept we kept rising. Um, which is why I see like the potential trigger as more the, the, the FOMC event, uh, where, you know, if you listen to Powell's congressional testimony last week, he kind of hinted that the Fed is still thinking about cuts, but it's probably not going to be six cuts, which what the market was pricing in, but three cuts this year, three to four. Uh, I think three cuts is more than realistic. And this was announced at the December FOMC meeting, which was also very bullish. And we're kind of still riding that wave. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you expect from the CPI with the new CPI report coming out? Um, it could, I mean, if you look at the trend, I mean, if you look at the trend from a longer period, it's obviously that we're in a, in a period of like inflation being more sticky and stagnant, not as, so for example, if, if it comes out, um, around 3% on an annual level, that means inflation is basically staying, staying stuck at, uh, at around 3% annually. Um, I, I'm looking at like the expectations, um, I have no idea essentially whether or not, whether or not it beats, obviously we will be prepared for whatever of course happens, but yeah. yeah, but, but, but my expectation is, is that kind of, you know, the, if you look at the secular trend, the secular trend, it's, it's going to continue on the same path. So more sticky inflation, meaning that the fed is probably not going to be able to, um, cut as much as people are expecting. Um, but again, in this current environment, it doesn't necessarily mean bad news for, for stocks. Yeah. So like that was, was one of the like, conversations. Like it was in 2022, right? Remember, every every time in 2022, every time there was a bad inflation period, there was a massive sell-off. There was like, you know, panic. That was a bear market situation. Right now, every time you get... So in the bear markets, when you get bad news, you sell off. When you get good news, you sell off. In bull markets, when you get good news, you buy. When you get bad news, you buy. That's where we are right now. Bull market. Yeah. It's, it's pretty wild. Pretty wild. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, so... One of the conversations that has continually come up was, will the Fed be cutting interest rates? Will they be raising interest rates? Is there, is there any expectation of, I mean, there were 
throwing out, oh, they're going to cut rates six times this year, four times this year. What are you expecting in terms of the Fed's decision making based on recent trends? And is there anything that investors should be noting that if numbers come out in a certain way that you expect the Fed to make potentially different decisions? Right. Again, they always like to say they're, they're data dependent in the sense that whatever happens with inflation is going to determine their decisions in terms of rate cuts. Um, I, they said in December, their project, their summary of economic projections stated that they expect free rate cuts this year. So by their own standards of economic projections. So they were saying inflation goes down uh, below 3%. Uh, GDP growth is around 2%. Um, I think these are realistic projections. Um, and in those, in that context, seeing free rate cuts should be expected, right? And I think the market has already priced that in over the past two months, two, three months for sure, especially after like that December FOMC meeting. Anything more than that, I think is a little bit too optimistic, right? So people are getting carried away because I remember at that point during the during that meeting, so after people were pricing in six rate cuts for this year and this keeps getting... Price, price down, right? So six rate cuts is, is so the first one was supposed to be in March already. That's not going to happen, right? Um, now, I think the, it's not going to be in May. Probably the first one could be in June. That, that's when the ECB announced their own uh, first rate cut in June. I think the Fed is going to follow in, down the same direction, even though the European and the American economy are not the same level, for sure. Europe has a, a slightly stickier problem with inflation. Um, but I think like these two central banks are going to be aligned in that time in, the, in, in terms of uh, how quickly uh, they're not going to rush into things, right? They're going to be aligned in how quickly they want to cut rates. Again, my expectations are baseline scenario, if you will, with highest probability is free cuts. I don't think rate hikes are going to happen this year. It would have to, I think like if there, if things go sour with inflation, if it starts going up again, I think the Fed is simply going to keep dropping the cuts instead of raising the rates, right? So if you see inflation going up or being more permanently sticky, then their uh, uh, decision-making pattern is probably going to be, all right, so we're not going to do three cuts. We're going to do two or one or zero, yeah? but not we're going to hide. That's probably, I mean, again, it can always happen. The probability is there, but it, I don't think it's that big. All right. Any other trends that are happening over the next, or any any big events that are happening over the next couple of weeks or months that you're also looking to? So, so apart from the you know the, the the CPI report, the option expiry that happens this week, there's FOMC next week, and that pretty much kind of determines what what, what keeps what's gonna what's gonna uh, drive markets ahead. And then we enter uh, second quarter, so Q2 of, of 2024. And if you remember from our one of our last conversations about the quarterly refunding announcement from the Treasury, as of Q2, so as of April, so April, May, and June, Treasury starts issuing much more bonds, right? So um, if, if you think about how the Treasury um, does things, um, they do announce it, right? So the market has time to price this in. However, it's very difficult to price in such a huge number of bond issuance, right? So for, for this particular quarter, we could, we're, we're going to see much more bonds being issued in the second quarter, which is going to affect bond yields, right? Uh, so remember the whole story is bigger supply of bonds, lower prices, yields go up. In this particular situation, that could provide a potential headwind for equities, right? So until that happens and until like there's this big change in monetary policy, uh, we don't see any huge headwind for equities, but we are looking at uh, uh, these two things in particular. Another, uh, something else in terms of not maybe weeks, but months, um, is the decision on quantity tapering and the re reverse repo facility from the Fed. This is something that a lot of people are going to be closely listening to at the next meeting in March, particularly in May. What will Powell say about the re reverse repo facility? Because that's something that has been funding, fueling, um, um, well, I'm not going to say fueling the rally, but it's been um, kind of in cahoots, with, in, in, not in cahoots, but in, in, um, in it created the opposite effect of uh, this whole quantitative tapering policy, right? Uh, because you didn't feel the, the the weight of the Fed's interest rate hikes. You didn't feel feel it on the banking sector, at least especially specifically for the big banks, because you had the reverse repo facility. But now, when the reverse repo is getting uh, it, it's getting depleted more and more, I think the projection is by summer it's going to go to close to zero. It's going to go to zero. 
Um, and then we can see another potential headwind for, um, for equities. And this is something that we're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate another one of these conversations, Vuk. We'll, uh, Thank you, Scott. we'll talk again soon. Yeah. And yeah, so we're from our new offices with New York in the background and <laughs> something else uh, in, in the skyline here. So um, yeah, hello from New York offices. Great. Fantastic. Thanks. Awesome. Vuk. Thanks, man. Bye-bye.